Welcome back, one and all. This week on the Game Dev Show, I am sitting down with a gentleman who has given 15 of his best years to casting esports. And in that time, he has had hundreds, if not thousands, of memes created in honor of his work at Riot covering League of Legends. It's uh, Mr. Tons of Damage himself, <laughs> <laughs> David Surly. David, how are you doing? Hello, I'm I'm good. It's It's nice to be here. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you. I can't wait. I can't wait. What time is it for you? 9 a.m. Uh, not, not horrible by any means, but, you know, I <laughs> normally I'm up a little bit later if I can help it. Yeah. Yeah. Were you playing anything last night? You've been playing any games recently? I have been. Well, I mean, the nice thing is the League of Legends preseason update dropped literally this morning. So, you know, once I'm done, I will just log on to League of Legends and play that some. The Riot Forge just dropped two of their games as well. So Hextech Mayhem and, and Ruin King both came out as well. So... Suddenly, it's just like a million Riot games to play. So I get to just keep playing things that are developed by the company I work for. Developed or published in the case of Riot Forge, because they they're a publisher in that case. But yeah, it's fun. I play games a lot. There you go. That's your answer. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. I mean, do you, do you have a lot of time to do that? Your role is unique, right? I can imagine when it's busy, it's extremely busy with Worlds, major competitions, new character releases. But then do you have downtime in between? Yeah, it, it certainly ebbs and flows pretty heavily, right? So, for example, during World, it's like, okay, you know, if there's stuff going on, if I have any kind of other engagements, I'm like, okay, I know I'm, like, leaving the country in, like, three days, so let's be ready to, like, fly out to Germany. Um, in the meantime, I've got, like, this place to be and this thing to do, and then I've got to get this stuff ready, and then, you know, I'm going to prepare for the tournament, and, okay, we're going to land, and then we're going to land, and in 36 hours, I am casting. So, like, let's be ready because we can't prep there, so make sure you're ready to go. And so it's a mix of, okay, you know, when do I hear which games I'm covering? Because in the case of, for example, the World Championship, which was in October of this year that I had casted, there were some teams I've never covered, right? And it's it's kind of irresponsible in a way to like do a lot of prep work for a team you will literally never cover. So of course, okay, we, you know, figure out which teams we can, you know, start doing prep work on, which we shouldn't be because it's just a waste of time in a lot of cases. And then, yeah, during the you know, the regular LCS season for, you know, sort of my day job, I guess. I'm casting two to three days a week. Okay, get ready for those things. You know, be on the meetings that prepare those shows because there's plenty of prep work to be done so that we know how we're going to cover those games. But then, yeah, thankfully, especially for the sort of regularly scheduled content, like there are days off, especially right now, world's over. I don't have much going on in the next couple of months. So I do have a lot of time off and this is my only engagement for the next week and a half. And then, you know, so there's downtime and there's you know more busy times and yeah, it just kind of comes and goes. Yeah, I think that's great. I think you're going to need that, right? Because worlds is like, worlds is intense now. I'm going to talk about this a lot more later, but Compared to 10 years ago, I mean, it's a sport, right? Like it's a sure, yeah. mainstream professional sport. The production value is like insane now. And what I really want to do though is find out about you growing up. Were you always into games? For as long as I can more or less remember, I am 34. So yeah, when I first got into games, you know, we didn't have broadband internet or anything. I was not much into consoles. We never really had those, but my dad has been working in computers for pretty much his entire adult professional life. So we had computers pretty early on. I remember loading up games on DOS, digital operating system. You know, I predate Windows. And <laughs> and playing, uh, the ones I can remember playing, like I'm not I'm not ultra old school, right? Like people who have like Pong on me and I don't, right? But, you know, side-scrolling platform shooters, you know, like Duke Nukem originally, you know, before it became mocked, IP, you know, a bunch of like Epic and Epic G games before, you know, they ran their own store and stuff like that. So kind of, you know, a lot of old school stuff there as well. But yeah, playing offline games. My my first online game, I think, was Myth. Yeah. So this was a like top down, like army management kind of game. I mean, the campaign is more or less humans versus undead sort of good guys versus the bad guys, but there was a PvP and you could like put an army together and and whatnot. You know, I started playing online games for maybe around middle school-ish, like around mm. there, maybe, you know, 10 something. But yeah, I've, I've been playing games for basically ever and I've always really enjoyed it as a hobby. Obviously looking at the parallels of what you do now and what you've done for a long time very successfully being a caster, were you good at communicating when you were younger? Like, was, did you talk a lot at school and... I only barely remember this. I had a pretty severe lisp as a kid, actually. I, I think I said all my S's as THs. And I remember like going to speech therapy after school one day. And this is like the shortest speech therapy of all time. Um, it's like 
let's call it third grade. I don't know. It was an elementary school at some point. So, you know, pick one of those six years. Uh, I remember going in to like, you know, functionally the nurse's office, you know, just like some some office building at my elementary school. And, you know, she brings out this like elementary reading book, right? It, it's, you know, baby learns to read basically, right? It's like, look at the giraffe, the giraffe walked down the road. It's that, right? It's something really easy. <laughs> it was just like, okay, but make an S sound now. And I was like, okay, snake. You did it. Good job. You fixed it. And like that was like, that's my memory of it. Maybe it was like way longer and I forgot all of it. But my memory has been like, it was a 20 minute session with someone being like, no, but make an S sound though. And I was like, oh, okay, got it. But as a, as a kid, I was always the nerdy unpopular kid, right? I was the, the hardcore gamer. So I was, I was never, ever popular through middle school, through college. As far as like, you know, learning to, to talk good or whatever, it was... I think the fascination started with around maybe StarCraft era, which was middle school for me. I guess I had kind of come across a little bit of online shoutcasting and whatnot, but I just kind of remember at some point, because I was also not only the nerdy unpopular kid, but I was also the smart kid. In grade school, I was one of three kids who walked to the middle school to take pre-algebra before like even the advanced kids would take it when they were actually in middle school. So I was like two years advanced in math and whatnot. And so it was just like, okay, cool. I'm the smart kid. So I would help people. They knew to come to me if they have like math problems. I remember in middle school math, we always had a uh, extra credit question on our math tests on our quizzes, like every week or two. And one of the kids wrote, see the answer on David's test as like his answer for the extra credit question. Uh, but they didn't bother. I just said like, just, go, just, just reference this one. It's whatever he wrote. Uh, it was literally what he, what he wrote there for the answer. An actual interaction I had as a developing child, right? So I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like smart at stuff. I can teach people stuff. So I feel like that's kind of can i guess uh, mm. but yeah i learned to be half decent at it sort of later on uh high school college age i think you did economics your degree is in economics isn't it right so i went Which to is... college and this whole time i didn't know what i wanted to be doing um like yeah. i knew like i liked games okay great but i didn't know what my career would be i really didn't have any obvious aspirations and so when i first went to college i applied for computer engineering, because I was a math nerd, so I wanted to do some math stuff and work with computers. So computer engineering seems to line up, but I picked the major and I didn't like it very much. Um, essentially, I realized that I didn't like advanced math very much. Um, I didn't mm -hmm. like the stuff beyond calculus, like the basic calculus I was fine with, but I like working with real numbers and not like moving exponents around. And, you know, the letter A never left the equation, you know? <laughs> you, in fact, added letters because soon as differentiated, you added a D down there, like D. And it's like, okay, yeah, we're just, we're, yeah, this is what I really enjoyed. And so I moved to computer science because part of computer engineering, there were intro to computer science courses. And I actually enjoyed that. That was actually fun to work with. And then bounced off that because I didn't like advanced computer science courses either. And so I stopped <laughs> economics because that was another topic that I really liked in high school. And that's when that actually stuck. The math remained fairly rudimentary. I mean, we still did calculus, but like we didn't go to like linear algebra and stuff. And yeah, I enjoyed the subject matter. It was mm. like economics is I mean, certainly pretty nerdy, but it's about decision making. You know, there's often like an entire course on game theory and whatnot. There's a bunch on statistics as well. So there's a huge event on econometrics, which is just using statistics well. It's just, you know, the science of applied statistics um, to human behavior. And this is all stuff that I really, really enjoyed. And so it was it was a bunch of subject matters that I really liked. And so I majored economics. I eventually dropped out about half a year before getting my uh, degree to go oh, work man. at Riot to, to start my internship. But yeah, it was, it was like, okay, cool. But how many employed economists do you know who actually use their economics <laughs> degree, right? So I don't know. Um, it's awkward as well, because my son is, uh, he's, we were at parents evening, but mm. for him to go into like college basically. And he was looking at uh, maths and economics. And I was yeah. like, but it's like, it's great to know this. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, what's great, no, uh, what's great is if, if you do any level of learning in statistics, you'll realize that you're going to hate almost all news articles ever because I mean, a good rule of thumb, right, is like, okay, I'm going to have someone prove me that like something is true. Okay. And it's like, just think to yourself, like, what would it take? Like, what would I like to see? Like, what data would I like to see to show me that it's accurate? And then you see whatever they post and like, that's not how that works. Like, that's not even the right thing to measure. Like, I'm I'm getting lied to right now. Um, so it's like nice and eye opening to get like any level of statistical training because you realize how badly it's used and you just feel bad. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Do, have you, do you use any of it? Any of your a bit. you've learned like now? I mean, it must be quite hard, right? Like it, it must be a stretch. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, one of the courses I took was the economics of energy production. And this is before, you know, solar wind power took off a lot. So this was still about like making gas plants and whatnot. But, you know, so yeah, nowadays that's pretty useless information. I mean, basically, <laughs> I mean, the funny thing was though, it's like so many of these topics were like, 
it was more rudimentary skills, right? Like, so, so statistics, you know, a lot of it I knew how to do, but like we started learning actual statistical software, you know, MATLAB and R and things like that. You know, again, it was fairly basic mathematics up to sort of standard level calculus. And it was, you know, standard game theory stuff that I kind of intuitively understood, but it's all applied, right? It's like, well, we're going to look at things like, you know, interest rates and, and whatnot and apply it to like, here's the economics of building out a power plant and like selling power back to people and, and whatnot and, and how that all works. And it's like, okay, cool. Like I all understand the math and it's kind of enjoyable to do, you know, vaguely algebra level math again, but you know, through the lens of, you know, figuring out the economics of building out a power plant or something like that. So in a lot of cases, it was like a refresher on skills I kind of already had, but it was like applying them in real situations, but I thought it was actually pretty valuable and just mm. good to think about. So the idea of, of working through game theory and using statistics are the two that I use the most today. Yeah, but you know, Through casting, I mean, and, and really in almost any job anyone has, I feel like you're going to pull from prior experiences pretty heavily. And so I am, you know, the math nerd of the casters. I did a video actually just yesterday, but I, I'm known for every time the game puts out patch notes, League of Legends patches every two weeks, I make one to two hour long videos going over the patch notes, usually mathing out everything that's mathable. And so it's like, yes, well, this item got buffed by 400 gold, but lost 20 ability power. So let me tell you, and just... <laughs> um, it's an important part of the team, right? Like it reminds mm-hmm. me like, you know, D&D teams. You need a diverse team to be effective, right? If you're all yeah. the same... You're not going to get anywhere. I've got, I've got to ask you about this. Is going to kind of change the subject completely. That's okay. But <laughs> where did the name Freak come from? Because obviously you're known as Freak, right? Like sure, yeah. Millions of people. But yeah, where from, where was that? Where did that come from? This would have been around middle school, high school. So like I said, I was definitely the sort of outcast nerd for most of my childhood. I mean, this was peak, probably not even yet 2000. It would have been definitely been 90s, I'm pretty sure. You know, late 90s, maybe maybe around 2000, but Leet Speak exists on the internet, if you don't know, where you, you know, replace letters with numbers. So like, you know, hello is maybe like H3110, you know, would be like a decent way of doing it. If you want to be really hardcore, you do like, you know, backslash hyphen backslash, you know, you'd make like an H be kind of slanted, but you could do like the, the vertical line breaks as well. And so it was basically just a misspelling of the word freak, right? Just put a PH instead of an F. And it's like, yeah, because I'm kind of a freak. That's kind of what I felt like. Like I was just kind of an outcast, whatever, you know, no one's really like me. That's okay. You know, and so that was just kind of the, not necessarily ironic, but okay, this is who I am. That's fine. Like whatever, it's mm. accepting that. My family was always like reasonably supportive as people. A phrase we used to say all the time was weird is good. My sister was also a nerd. Oh uh, yeah, um, that's great. Not so much, not so much into computers. She's a drama nerd, but yeah, like, okay, we were nerdy. My dad works in computers, right? Like, it's like, yeah, we're just going to embrace the fact that, you know, yeah. we're, we're not typical. And now comic books, you know, are popular and whatnot, or at least the IPs <laughs> are. So, you know, the the world has advanced to catch up with us finally, but Last exactly. time here, isn't it? Like, that's yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, I think... Yeah, um, so I, I misspelled Freak, and that was, that was the name, and I've just kept it kind of ever since. That's pretty cool, though. Good on you as well for keeping it, because I know so sure. many people are like, as they get older, like Oh, yeah, son, and it wasn't my first it's... name. I really? What was your, what was no. your first name? <laughs> my first one was uh, for, for this online game, uh, Myth. It was Tempest, and I didn't know like what to pick, but it was around that time, maybe a year or so ago, uh, Magic the Gathering a set had come out that was Tempest. I was like, that's a cool name. Mm-hmm. And my password was Stronghold, which is another Magic the Gathering set that came out. But, you know, my very first login was Tempest and Stronghold. I had an AOL screen name, I guess. I don't know how it was before or after. But in that, I was Star X-Wing. Um, <laughs> so, you know, those are those were the first <laughs> online names I could think of that, that I ever used. It was Star uh, X-Wing and or Tempest. Honestly, um, like, from, it's, from, it yeah. makes you cringe, doesn't it? Like, it, well, it makes me cringe when I think back. It's so hard to have one that's timeless. They're just tough, right? Like, they're tough to keep. But um, it was very interesting to see, like, how Freak and David run in equilibrium with one another. Moving, like, through your journey, like, before you became a caster, you were actually, you were a professional Warcraft 3 player. Yeah. Back in 2006, you won a tournament. What was it like back then, like, game, like professional gaming back then? Because... Sure. It's 15 years ago, but it just feels like it's completely different. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, my sort of first taste of playing at a high level at my peaks, so like, you know, as if an all time list comes out, I'm not this high. But at my at my peak, you know, at, at the scene when it was still running, I was the second best player in all of the Americas. And you know that would have included even like oceanic players as well. Uh, I basically was like picking countries where like I was better than their players, but like you know they're probably about ten better players in China, Korea, and Europe each. But you know around that, like I'm I'm around the thirty something ish best player in the world, uh, number two in the Americas. And so hey, if you know we have the modern day League of Legends team and, and there's an LCS, like I'm clearly in it. In fact, there was basically one big overarching online league 
where like basically teams or organizations would sign up and they'd field about five players and about 10 teams would make it. And so I played for two seasons of this like international pro league, basically, and like did pretty well, had like a 50% win rate. So like I could keep up with the other players in the international pro league, but being the roughly best player on my team meant that like we had worse results of 50, 50 and eventually we got relegated back out of the league. So yeah, I was, I was a quite good player, good enough where if the scene was advanced, I could make a living doing it. That said, the scene was not very advanced. I did not make a living doing it. This was uh, yeah. basically, I was good during college for the most part that, uh, so this tournament you're talking about, um, if I recall correctly, the one, the one we're going to be referencing, um, this would have been a, maybe a seasonal tournament um, for Warcraft 3. So I won the like US West ladder qualifier. So I was in California. I, you know, played on the, the, the West Coast American queue. I won there in the finals. Uh, someone actually cheated. So as a player, I was already better than, but uh, he account shared with this other player who like at the time was maybe the most established North American player, but I had kind of already passed him as far as like skill was concerned and I beat him 2-0. So that was in fact true. They never got caught for cheating because Blizzard didn't even bother to look or any of that. But so I like I won the US West qualifier. I went to Korea to play in their you know seasonal tournament, whatever. I got fifth out of eighth, which isn't great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's really like winning one match roughly. But so it's like, OK, you know, I did like kind of well. I went to Korea. They, they gave us these like weird spacesuit looking uniforms to wear that were kind of strange, but it's a, it's a keepsake. <laughs> um, That's great. Yeah. I mean, it, they look really stupid, but it, it's oh. cool to have because it's, it's so unique. Um, I wish you were wearing it now. Like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I can, I can send you a picture afterwards. I can try to find it. I'm, I'm sure I didn't throw it out. That's but, great. but yeah, the, the tournament scene was, there were a mix of random online stuff that essentially nothing ever had prize money or very few things did at least online. Uh, at least not for the placements that we tended to get or I tended to get. There were weekly $200 tournaments that just someone paid for. Someone's like, I'm just going to throw in $4,000 and we're just going to run 20 weekly $200 tournaments because I want the entertainment and we're going to save the replays. I get to watch them and I get, watch, I get to watch good players play. And of course, it's all online. You know, Americans fighting Koreans, fighting Bulgarians, like the ping is really, really high, but that's competitive, right? But that's the competition. That's where it's done. So, you know, the vast majority of my competitive games were really high ping because there are only so many other Americans in yeah. like my tier of play, but you know, playing in random American leagues were like, we wouldn't care about the lineup. we would be like, yeah, just throw these players in and who cares. But like technically there was an art to like figuring out, okay, well on turtle rock, the normally playing an undead player. So, you know, we're gonna make sure we get this guy on, you know, you had kind of stuff going on there, but there was also like a in-person, a land tournament scene. Unfortunately, my sort of rise to the top was pretty short lived. And even when it was there legitimately, one of the tournaments that I was, ready to go to. I was top two. I should have been going. Um, they just didn't hold a qualifier. They held a poll instead. I am not oh kidding. Uh, they, just, they just botched running a qualifier at all. And I for sure would have gone and I would have had to book my own plane ticket to France to compete, but I would have gone and they just didn't. They just didn't follow the people. Well, so they were and, ran a poll, like what, who people like liked or uh, what was it based uh, on? I, I, it was our internal experts are going to pick people. There's going to be an online oh poll for like God. a fan vote. And I don't know, something else. Like, I think it was like supposedly a three-part process. They picked the guy that I had just beaten 2-0 like three months ago, right? Like I was clearly the second best person for the spot. And I don't think they even picked me or the other guy, right? They just picked people that like they knew from before. It's like, oh, this is horrible. So, so you know, stuff was run really poorly, you know, to be clear. <laughs> It is like, that sounds awful. I was going to ask you if you missed it, but it sounds like there wasn't a lot to miss. It just sounds, I mean, something has to come from nothing, right? Like you plant seeds, right, they course. grow. Do you ever wish that you'd been born like 10, 15 years later? Because I feel like I look at kids now and the opportunity within mm -hmm. esports, the oh, infrastructure is yeah, so there. S some yes, some no. Um, yeah. You know, ultimately I can't complain with where I am now. My life is great. Shock asking a lot of fun. Life has turned out well for me and, and better than I probably would have thought as a kid, as a high schooler, as a college student, you know, everything, everything's been really fortunate for me. Uh, so I, I, you know, I can't say I'd like really want to go back and rewrite anything or, you know, live a different life instead. That said though, like when I was competing, yeah, it would have been nice that like I was magically competing in a world where esports is more established and Hey, mm -hmm. maybe Warcraft three never would have been quite the title, at least not in America. PC gaming is smaller in America. RTSs are not that big either in America, you know, like would that have turned into me moving to another country to compete? I don't know. Would that have turned into something else? I don't know. Would Warcraft 3 have had, even if it was transplanted, right, from 2003 to 2013 or 18 or 20, would that have had a big enough scene to support more pro play? I mean, more, sure, but like what would have actually looked like? Would there have been anything to really do? I don't know that answer. Certainly streaming would have been a thing. So if there's enough following, then, you know, streaming could have been a, a bigger deal mm -hmm. and that would have been part of it. But so in the sense that, hey, it would have been nice to compete in a bigger scene that was more fleshed out. Absolutely. But, 
you know, would I change my life? No. So I, you know, mm. I can't complain. Yeah, that's fair. Are you, do you still play RTS games now? Have you played any recently? Almost not at all. No, I bought the StarCraft 2 and its expansions all when they came out. Initially, as part of a, a bet to like maybe going to esports with that one as well, but it didn't really go for it. No, there's just like aren't really many RTSs out there, right? Just in yeah, general, there aren't a lot of high quality ones, so I, I haven't really spent time. Yeah, it's been mad, hasn't it? There has been like a void, I think, for like a decade at least of like art, high quality RTS. I'm playing Age at the moment, but it's obviously literally oh, nice, just come right. out. But I love it because it, it reminds me of, I used to love General Zero Hour. That used to be, I used to play that a lot with my friends mm-hmm. back in the day. And it's quite nice to see an old school RTS come through, but you know, it's quite a broad question. But do you think Riot would ever be tempted? Because obviously Riot, when you look at League, you look at the amount of law behind League, you've even got your factions now, right? And mm-hmm. it almost lends itself to having an RTS because you have that backdrop there with like Damasia and the, the other warring factions. Sure. I would say never say never. Like, certainly I, I have no idea what's going on, right? So like, this is, this is you know, hashtag not a leak because I truly don't know anything. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, never say never. Sure. Like if Age of Empires does really, really well, right? Mm. And, you know, a lot of the like explosive people who made, I think like Frost Giant Studios, like, like they're, they're making an RTS as well. It's like, if it turns out that there's actually suddenly a really good global market and RTSs are back, I don't see why not, right? Like the VP of design at Riot is Tom Cadwell, who was a designer on Warcraft 3. You know, he helped build a game I sank, you know, 10 years of my life into. So like, there's a world, sure, right? Like why, you know, Riot makes competitive multiplayer games for the most part. That's a big umbrella they tend to make things for. And if there's a a world where people want to play another competitive RTS, why wouldn't they? That Mm. said, again, I'm not sure RTS is very big. My understanding is RTS aren't very big. Like a lot of people are happy to play Age of Empires because nostalgia is great and that's wonderful. But like (laughs) how how many people are going to play? Like like for me, right? Like I I mean, again, Mm. I spent more than 10 years of my life playing StarCraft and WarCraft 3 and then StarCraft 2 as well. Like I spent a lot of time being really competitive in RTS. And I'm just like, that's nice Age of Empires exists. But like I never got an Age of Empires. So like it's not a like IP that I care much about. And so I'm like, oh yeah, it's a high quality RTS. Yeah, I have other games to play. And maybe it's just like I've moved on and I'm projecting it on other people. And again, if, it's, if it does well, then great. Like I have no problem people making games that they want to make and that people yeah. play games they want to play. Like, of course, like I'm not going to shit talk anyone for, for the games they want to play. But I just don't think that's a large group of people. Yeah, it will be inter- It will definitely be interesting to see where it goes. I think you're completely right. I think that, do you know what the hard thing is? Like, and not to digress too much. I think games like League, like Fortnite, Warzone, what's happened is they've created games as a platform right? Where you've literally got a game that's going to be 10 years old and which, you know, between those three, maybe Apex and probably Counter-Strike Go, you're looking at a massive portion of the player base already, right? So for an RTS to step out, it almost has to, it's competing with those, which it wasn't 10, 15 years ago. Well, 15 years ago, especially. So I I personally love RTS, but Mm -hmm. I completely agree that there has to be a, an opportunity for it. And I think it will be interesting to see how our age does. And obviously you've got Relic who've helped develop it. Obviously it's Microsoft as well. So they've got the back in there, but let's bring it back to you and League, right? And right, okay, sure. how did this come about? How did, how did, yeah, just how did it come about? How did this happen? Yeah, so basically I was playing Warcraft 3 in high school and one of my closest friends got me into starting playing Defense of the Ancients, the original mod made by made by Yule. If if you're an OG Dota player, you know who Yule is. And so this was a, a, a Warcraft 3 mod called Defense of the Ancients. You pick a character, it's very much like the Blue Legends, right? Same genre, absolutely. A year later, that evolved into Dota All-Stars as Ginsu picks it up. A couple years later, that got evolved further and someone else picked up the project. And so I was playing like a fair bit of Dota in high school. I started playing it more in college as well and essentially through a bunch of different confluence of events so okay i was playing a lot of dota okay so i I was playing mobas in the genre i heard about league of legends signed up for the beta one of the people who worked at riot back then we're now fast forwarding to like 2009 because this is when i applied to the company one of the people who worked there in 2009 urged me to apply to an internship I knew him through gaming. There's kind of a mix of things going on. So one, he was a staff writer on an esports website. And so he had interviewed me at a couple of different tournaments that we both were at. Also, he was at college, the roommate of my like team manager in Warcraft 3. So someone who would like make sure we all got up on time and, you know, told us when the games were. And so he knew me through like Ventrilo calls kind of like was aware of me. Again, we met up in person a couple of times for for stuff like that. So then through that kind of like 
we became contacts. He sort of got me into the beta of League of Legends a little bit early on uh, during one of the closed beta periods, urged me to kind of pick the game back up after a couple of updates, and then urged me to apply to the company. And my application to basically the community internship that I got into was like, hey, here's me. I'm really good at League of Legends. I think like there were some rankings posted by that point in time and I was top 500. I eventually was number one. Here's all my backlog of pro gaming stuff done with Warcraft 3. Here's my catalog of audio commentary and shoutcasting work I've done with Warcraft 3. Uh, some of it professional, some of it very hobbyist. And that was enough to get an interview and, you know, get in the door and do well in the interviews. And that turned into a community internship that turned into creating the Champion Spotlight series for League of Legends. And, you know, that continued on and became a full-time shoutcaster eventually in 2013. That's crazy. So when you joined, you you were joined as a like basically a community coordinator. Like then, yeah. four years later, became a, a caster. Yeah, that's mad. I think it's. I think it's, I, I bought League back when it was on a disc with Annie and Rise on the front cover. Mm-hmm. It was a black box. I think I bought it for seven pounds from like Game, nice. which is which is crazy. Like you look at it now, and obviously I can't remember when you guys stopped making it as a disc, but it's just it was so long ago. And I played it for years, like years and years and years, and I loved it. And the only reason I stopped playing was life basically and the fact that i was never any good i think the highest i got to was gold and that's good uh, i was that's well, the top you know, third at least you're better yeah. than most people <laughs> like, be clear appreciate- about that you're better than most people <laughs> i appreciate that i mean i don't yeah. think i would be now um but like but one of the, do you know one of the things i loved and i i'm assuming you would have been involved i'm assuming it was back or still there back then was the tribunal oh, okay i sure. thought the tribunal was one of the, like the most innovative even now i think it's one of the most innovative ways of creating a relationship with your community. Um, what happened to it, right? Like, I'm just, just to be clear, just sure. so everyone knows, like the tribunal, basically what would happen is if there was an incident in a game, which could have been toxic, lead to a ban, that could be reviewed by players. Like you sign up to the tribunal and so a neutral player could review these instances, almost like a jury, and then pass their judgment and then that player would receive the punishment, the equivalent punishment. Maybe that's a ban, maybe it's a suspension and so on. Why, yeah, why was it removed? So as best I can recall, you know, again, there's a good chance that some details are wrong. I didn't work directly on the team, but like it was fundamentally flawed. So here's the thing, right? If people get reported for toxic behavior or, you know, verbal abuse or, you know, hate speech or gameplay related stuff, it's like, okay, well, enough people reported you. And the thing is, it's not just, well, there were a bunch of reports where they showed up. Um, the game system itself also identified culprits that way to like understand what like a good report was. So it, the game already knows who's toxic. It's just like, hey, humans, you want to vote yes? And here's the thing. Because the system was so good at it, people realized very quickly, it's like, oh, all the reports are guilty because it doesn't bring up fraudulent cases basically ever. So everyone just learned, oh, well, I'd log into tribunal and I just click yes for 15 minutes and then I've hit my cap for the day and I go do something else. And it's like, we don't need people for that. A robot can just be like, yep, we did it, right? Like, so there wasn't actually a benefit there. I realized that there's something about like, oh yeah, people can feel good about the fact that they're cleaning up the environment. And like, I can kind of understand that that's psychologically satisfying, but we realized really, really quickly that there's not even a use for a human element. Even if there was a use for a human element, people didn't want to be the human element. People just wanted to be like, yeah, punish. Yeah, punish. Yeah, punish. And these are going to be somewhat made up numbers because I don't remember anymore because the numbers were nine years ago or something, not quite, but you know about that. It's like, oh yeah, 90% of people have 100% convict rate. They just all click convict. So like, why even bring in people? They're actually robots at this point. So why are we using people? And I know that they did throw in false positives out there. Like they would throw in cases where it's like, here's a 070 Annie who never chatted and like had boots of speed and like a Ruby crystal, which is by the way, very little for those who don't play league, AKA she was doing really, 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 really poorly. And this was an intentional false positive. This is like, this is a player who had a bad game. They didn't intentionally feed. They didn't, you know, try to kill themselves. They had a bad game. And as soon as you voted convict, you would quickly get a feedback report like, hey, by the way, that wasn't a a bad one, right? Like this wasn't one that was convicted, by the way. Like you voted convict, but this was a safe one. And it didn't change player behavior. No one cared. So it's like, yeah, you could throw in 70 times as many false positives and like try to coach out behavior and like try really hard to weed out perennial punish voters. But like it wasn't doing anything. The system already knew realistically who the bad actors were. And it's like, We can just ignore the human element and it doesn't matter anymore. That said, there is like an extra piece now where like when you report someone for bad behavior, again, because the robot can do it, you can get a feeder report saying like, you reported someone for saying the N-word. Don't worry, they've been banned, right? And you actually just get the pop-up like you reported someone, we took action. And it's like, oh, I cleared up the environment, right? So you get that same psychological satisfaction. 
the last time I played, I don't know if it's changed since then, but you actually got progress. There was like almost like a progression bar where you could level up from like reporting people who were doing like toxic behavior and then they would, you get a notification when you next logged in. Yeah. I mean, if the results are what you already know they're going to be, then it completely makes sense to remove that part of the process. Yeah. Okay, cool. So like moving like yeah, four years later and obviously your casting, did you ever think that casting would become what it is today, right? Like, so when you took that role in 2013, did you think Riot are on something here in seven years? It's going to be this big. I mean, I was I saw on LinkedIn today this video of and it's from in China, and there's literally thousands of people in like this town square watching Worlds live, mm-hmm. and you're like, that is crazy. Like, you just can't imagine that. Did you ever have a feeling though at the time? I was more hopeful than having a feeling like I didn't know where it was going to go. I don't, I don't tend to plan that far in the future, actually. Like, I don't really do a lot of what ifs, but OK, I know traditional sports are very big, right? And people, you know, work full time in traditional sports in, in all kinds of avenues, right? They're, you know, reporters and players and casters and, and all kinds of staff that do stuff. And so I'm always vaguely aware that like, well, yeah, you know, if League of Legends is the biggest football in the U.S., that would be pretty cool, right? And I, you know, vaguely know what football looks like. I've watched that show. You know, I've been to those stadiums. <laughs> so, so you know, there's the hope. And, and throughout high school and college, playing StarCraft, playing Warcraft 3, things like this, you know, the Chinese and Korean scenes were always bigger. So mm-hmm. I knew that, you know, there were, player, there were other places on the planet with more developed esports ecosystems where, you know, players are more likely to glean incomes from this and, and have bigger leagues and bigger events and stuff going on. So um, I knew that was a possibility as well. Uh, by the time we started the LCS in 2013, um, there was already a televised league in Korea. I mean, there have been televised leagues in Korea for, you know, over a decade. They were doing StarCraft and stuff back then as well. Uh, I'd watched some of it, but... So again, I, I knew like where it could kind of go. I didn't know how fast. I didn't know what it would necessarily look like, but I knew this kind of stuff was happening other places and in other titles and in other sports. So, you know, yeah, I was like vaguely where that could still happen. And and it's been kind of cool to ride that that mm. upward trajectory. Do you have a uh, do you have a favorite tournament you've casted in that time? Um, it's tough. I'm not really sure. You know, there's ones that are cool for different memories and different reasons. So uh, the 2017 World Championship was uh, the first time I cast World Finals since 2011. So that's just like special because it's, you know, getting to do the final. And it was also in the Bird's Nest of Beijing. So it's the biggest venue you've ever been at either. Of course, sadly, I wasn't local cast because I don't speak Mandarin. So, you know, we're casting online. I'm happy to be there in person. Um, the other kind of sad part is that we were kind of in a sort of underground sort of ring around the arenas. We weren't like in the crowd. We didn't see any of that stuff in person. You know, we're mm-hmm. basically casting to a monitor with a camera and, you know, seeing the other camera shots of everything else. But like we were just in a work area, basically. So aside from being able to physically hear the crowd, uh, you know, we weren't there in a sense. But that's still, you know, really special, of course. Even just doing the, the first World Championship 2011, just doing it at all. Like that that's really cool, just being there. I guess the one that will stand out maybe the most, though, would have been maybe 2012 or 2013, where we moved to the world championship being at its own sort of venue. Like it wasn't just, Oh yeah, we're at dream hack. And also over here, we've quartered off some area and that's the league of lessons tournament. Um, but it's like, no, we're just going to be at a venue and we're running the tournament and people show up for the tournament. And so that was, that was kind of a standout for me. I think those mm. are, those are probably the ones that stand out the most. And like milestones in your like yeah, exactly. your career, like these key moments. Do you ever like I'm British, so I naturally align myself to like G2 fanatic, right? Like mm-hmm. I just do. And I feel like, you know, G2 were doing great a couple of years back. Not I can't follow it this year to be honest, but like I know not a great year. And not yeah, I, I think I'd have seen if it was a good year. But I know Fnatic back in the day were obviously incredible. And mm-hmm. you just have ebbs and flow, like you see it with all sports, right? You have clubs that are on top and then they're at the bottom, they're on top. It just naturally happens. But I will always get behind those guys. <laughs> do you, you know, being American, do you naturally align? I feel like when I listen to the commentary, sometimes I can feel a bit more passion coming through for some of the American teams. Absolutely right. Like I, I've lived in America virtually my entire life. Certainly I, I support the American teams. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of the LCS teams. Whenever they go nationally, I'm, of course, I want them to win. Right. I'm cheer for them as a fan, but also like, hey, I would like if my league looked good. Right. It would be great if we were the best. So, you know, for all kinds of selfish reasons, I'm absolutely going to be hoping that the, the North American teams do well. <laughs> so at the beginning of the show, like we were chatting about your work flow, right, like and what it looks like throughout the year. But tell us about the sacrifices you have to make, because I imagine you've had to have a like you, you mentioned the word hope earlier. I imagine you've had to have a lot of faith at points in this journey to like see it through to this point. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think we've been very fortunate. So my initial entry into the scene as a working professional was taking an internship. So, you know, my first few months were unpaid. I showed up to work. I did work. I was an unpaid intern for the first bit, then a paid intern, which meant, you know, more or less minimum wage. And thankfully, again, very fortunate, right? You know, no overworked medical bills. My parents could afford to pay for university. I suppose if I was in a different country, university would have been free anyway, but still fortunate that I'm in a situation where I got to go to school and not have debts, you know, racked up because of it. My parents had bought me a used car as well. It's like I had a vehicle as well, right? And again, no no car payments over my, my head as well. As it turned out, I had a friend I could stay with. So I even got to live in LA rent free. There's a lot of, you know, four things that happened, but otherwise would have been accruing debt and whatnot while, you know, trying to make my way in. And then, yeah, finally, once I started making any money, it was, you know, pretty easy to, to subsist, right? No problems at all at that point. But the weird thing, though, is I guess even now is all the travel. I've never much liked to travel. Mm. I don't like being away from home. I'm not much of a sightseer either. And so, for example, with the World Championship, I was away from home for three and a half weeks. And it was like a very busy three and a half weeks for my wife. So she's really busy. We have some dogs as well. And so she's like really, really busy with work and has to take care of the dogs and has no one to help her out with stuff. And so she's doing all the chores around the house and a bunch of work and whatnot. And so I come home jet lagged and she's still really, really busy. And it's like, you need to take stuff. And I'm like, it's normally be time off, but OK, we're, we're onto it. Um, so, <laughs> you know, just sometimes there's really spikes of being busy and spikes of being away from home and the extra fun of being across the world in the COVID era where, you know, people are really urged to isolate a fair bit more and, and, you know, not go out quite as much. And so a lot of time spent alone in a hotel room waiting for my day back at the studio to cast again and then back to the hotel room and stay there for another four days. That is fairly tough, you know, as the extra kind of added constraint. But I've overall, though, say just I've been fortunate in that, like, I've been able to kind of chase my dreams and there have never been really that that big of speed bumps in the way. Now, some of those have changed, right? Like I tried to be a competitive Warcraft 3 player and there wasn't an appetite for that, despite being very, very good. And if the scene were teleported 15 years in the future, maybe there would have been. But in 2006, there wasn't a, an appetite for, you know, mm. many American Warcraft 3 aspirants. And so, you know, OK, well, we have to give up on that one. We're not playing that game anymore. It's There's no future in it. So, you know, there's something going on in that in that regard. But I don't, I've always felt like honestly quite fortunate for almost all yeah. of this. I mean, could you see yourself doing this forever? Like, or is there an emotional toll that you feel is like, at some point, something's going to have to give? I don't feel like quitting anytime soon. I really like what mm. I do. Everything, you know, hoping League of Legends sticks around for a long time. Or, you know, if, if it doesn't, there's something else that I can cast that I'm good at that I can jump onto. But I really do like commentary. I don't feel like the strain is, is very large. Yeah, it would be great to not have to travel and whatnot, or at least as much. But I very much do love my job. So in no rush to change any career paths. Do you have like a, um, I was just thinking about you being in the hotel room before you go down and you cast mm -hmm. uh, and like, you know, imagine like Rocky before a fight. Do you have like a, a period where you're staring at yourself in the mirror, just like slapping yourself with like a cold flannel, psyching yourself up? <laughs> I mean, what not is your preparation quite. like? <laughs> <laughs> right, not quite. Um, I will say I still get nervous a little bit for casting and actually I haven't gotten nervous in a while because there's no audience. So it's like I'm in an empty studio with my one or two co-casters and there's a camera that's already there. And then just someone in the headset says, OK, you're live, you know, three, two, one, go. And it's like, welcome to Worlds. But, you know, when we used to have audiences, you know, and hopefully soon again, it's like, OK, yeah, we're I could actually feel how big the events were, you know, for the last quite a long time. I mean, several years at this point, two years or so, nothing I've covered has felt big from like an obvious, tangible, you know, five senses kind of feeling because there hasn't been an audience for like any of it, or at least not a big mm -hmm. one for almost any of it. But normally, yeah, okay, we're doing a big event. Okay, like I'm doing world finals in, you know, 2017, for example. It's like, okay, this is like, this is the biggest event of the year. Okay, I'm the one getting the, the selection for this. Like, let's go, okay. But it goes away as soon as you start working, really. The camera is live, you know, the stream goes live and it's like, yep, I have to talk, there's no other choice. Um, and so it all just goes away because I you, you can't freeze up like and I, I don't freeze up like that's, you know, thankfully, mm. you know, I, I handle that reasonably well. The other thing I would do to a certain degree is is there's an amount of prep work where, OK, what's the story when a team wins? One of the, the requirements for a play a play caster is usually to have, you know, the big moments sound really big. And usually if, you know, a team is winning and they're going to win the series or win the world championship or win, you know, the match or whatever it's going to be, you know, that's supposed to be a moment. And normally all the stories that lead into that are already known. Sometimes there's things that you do, that you discovered during the game and that's fine. But like, Hey, you know, in the case of, I'll just, you know, again, pick 2017 when Samsung galaxy beat SK telecom T1, this is the end of the SKT dynasty. They had won three of the last four mm -hmm. world championships. They were clearly the winningest team in League of Legends history. They're still the greatest team of all time. But, you know, it was ending their dynasty. And so, you know, the, the end game call of, of that match ending is the SKT dynasty is over. And it's like, 
you don't say that when it's Fnatic versus Invictus Gaming and Invictus Gaming wins. It's like the Fnatic Dynasty. What Fnatic <laughs> Dynasty? What do you mean? Um, right. Go way it, back. I mean. <laughs> right. Right. But instead, it was it was a good call by a good friend of mine who's another great caster in Invictus Gaming who have never won anything. And in fact, uh, the LPL, their league, had also never won a world championship. And it's like, well, the crownless are finally king was like the line he said, which is great. And there's a lot that goes mm-hmm. into it. And so it's like you find the things that that line up. And so there, there's that. Right. It's like, OK getting myself in the moment okay what is this match going to feel like when this series is won like what's it going to feel like who's winning and then kind of like figuring out like what that is on both sides and figuring out what you want to say in those moments like that's kind of the only pre hyping i will do is figuring out like okay if i'm here and this is happening what am i trying to say so i'm like okay yeah i'm gonna say something like along the lines of the skt dynasty like it's something around that okay cool we move on and and then you know you just say what you want to say in the moment when it feels right yeah i think that's pretty cool i guess so you do have like a a loose idea so say something happens in a game we'll say a team goes 3-0 right and you're like mm-hmm. guys are 3-0 but we have to you have to emphasize how epic the final was because obviously three O fans want to see a 3-2 right like you want to see sure. like go, go down to a decider you have an idea you have a prep of an idea of what you would say in that moment have you ever had anything though that has happened like i don't know man like you know someone picks timo they go mid and you're like oh my god we're not we are not prepared for this like <laughs> Um, there, there have been a couple of things. Actually, one of the series I cast was actually quite along those lines. This was a really big match. It's one that a lot of League of Legends fans will remember uh, really strongly. It's T1 versus Rocks Tigers at Worlds 2017, 16, 18, one of those years. People have discovered that Zyra support's actually good. And so all the Korean teams are playing Zyra support. And Rocks Tigers in their dark week had prepped a counter pick, which is Misfortune support plus Ash AD carry. Misfortune support absolutely no one plays. In fact, people should still not play it. <laughs> it is only a counterpick to Zyra. That is the yeah. only purpose that Champion has in Misfortune support is, is played into Zyra with, with Ash AD carry. And so they've already locked in Ash, and then they lock in Misfortune, who's traditionally played in the exact same role Ash is, which means you you never pick these two champions. And we're sitting there like, is that a mistake? Did they pick the wrong champion? And one of our co is like, wait a second, no, I've seen this. People are playing Misfortune support in solo queue. It's a new thing. And we're like, okay, cool. It's a new thing. And it, it claps. Like, it's so good. <laughs> like, they lost game one. They then play this comp. They went back-to-back games. And, and SKT has to, like, start banning Misfortune support, which is, like, if, like, if you play that series, like, hey, by the way, game four, they're going to ban Misfortune support. You'd be like, what are you on? <laughs> um, it, it, like, that was on no one's bingo card. Uh, no one had odds for that one. And so it's like, that was a really cool moment. And it's like, okay, I usually am pretty good about saying, okay, this is surprising. Let's see how it plays out for him. You know, bold move, Cotton. And I'm always going to be very open-minded. I'm like, okay, you know, there, there's a world where this makes sense. Like, let's go about it. I think in general, pro teams are almost too close-minded, right? So as, as a quick story to end this, this topic, yeah, teams are really close-minded. So one of the players that qualified for that world championship only played two champions all year, and that was Zyra support and brand support. And he believed throughout the entire tournament until he got knocked out in the quarterfinals that Zyra support and brand support were both non-viable. They were not good enough to play. These are the only champs he played and didn't play them a <laughs> single time because he didn't believe um, the champs were good enough anymore. We go to the other quarterfinals, the Korean team's like, are you idiots? Zyra supports the best champ in the game. We play her uh, every game. <laughs> and it's like, wow, right? Uh, like, <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, I never, ever believe that, like, the game is solved. I never believe that everyone knows everything because I know that's not true. Uh, but anytime we do something new, I'm like, okay, let's see what it does. Like, I'm excited. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's great. I feel I feel for that guy though who didn't play Brand or yeah. Zyra. I mean, if, you, if that's all you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just feel like play what you know, dude. Like yeah. you know what I mean. Like you just change. And I think that, that you're exactly right. And I think it's probably one of the things I find find frustrating is I find this with any game where you ever select, you have to select characters is meta, right? Unfortunately, yeah. there is always going to be a meta because it's like the Rub- it's like this Rubik's cube, ever evolving, massive Rubik's cube versus players. It's almost like a collective Rubik's cube versus millions of players, and they're trying to solve it to find out what the optimum plays are and what the optimum characters are, optimum builds. But I feel like wor- Worlds is always a great opportunity to just break that a little bit and just be like, yes. no, we're going to do this. And I hope that continues. And I hope there's like in the future as like Lee continues to evolve, it introduces new ways of ensuring there's always going to be innovation within team selection. 
Yeah, it's actually done pretty well. And what's interesting is it's often the Korean teams who who bring the little bit of extra spice, right? They're the ones who are like, actually, Zara's support is good. And then also, you know, brought out the Misfortune support as the counter pick. At the World Championship this year, the Koreans were the first teams to bring out Yumi support. So the entire year was dominated by tank supports, by uh, champions who were meant to engage fights, you know, a Leona or a Rakan or a Nautilus, things like this. And the very first game of the group stage is Damon Kia being like, oh, we're first picking Yumi, by the way. Yumi is the best champion. She's hardcore enchanter, actually theoretically weak to tank supports as far as data has shown us from match made games and then we also saw that oh actually yeah people really want to play nami and lulu as well who are also called enchanter supports they're squishier or you know buff up your teammates backline kind of access kind of champions and it's like cool the entire year we weren't seeing any of these three champions and yet now we see all three of these champions and it's like huh mm-hmm. this could have been done much sooner i'm pretty sure but so yeah every time at the end of the year it's like people finally realize a little bit more of what was viable the whole time and just like no one ever bother to spend time to realize it and it's tough like spending time practicing something that you're not sure is good it can be a waste of time right if you're wrong you wasted practice for your entire team Mm -hmm. and everyone's passing you now there's a an immense pressure to say well we might not innovate but we can still improve and then you know when you have a very long break you know for something like worlds it feels like people have to then go innovate because it's been so long since the last recorded game that you you have to find out like well what what is good now because something Mm -hmm. has changed certainly since then yeah i think it's um Often it's defined by power, right? Like play a character power as well. And obviously yeah. that ebbs and flows throughout the year. And I think that's actually what's, I actually like that. I like patches. I know it sounds mad because a lot of people are like, no, you yeah. need it to keep stable. But you're like, actually, no, because this is how people innovate. If you break a character, yeah. you create a character who's overpowered, then all of a sudden the counters of that character become overpowered because naturally more people select that mm-hmm. character. Have you ever seen a character at the point of champion spotlight and thought, Oh God, like this is going to be, this is going to be hell because it's so broken, but it's too late. <laughs> um, I don't think so. So what's interesting is for the first half of all of them, like probably for the first, you know, two, three years, like up to 2013 when I you know, became a full-time shoutcaster instead, I was always the one recording the, the footage and whatnot. But the difficulty is I was easily the best player in the office for almost that entire time. I mean, when I, when I first played, I was literally rank one in the ladder. So there can't be anyone as good as me, um, <laughs> or at least, at least. At least there can't be anyone better than me. Like, clearly, you know, I'm not like just the gift to the game or anything. But eventually, you know, <laughs> right, I hired more and more strong players. As I had a full time job, I wasn't playing as much. So, you know, I got eventually passed. But yeah, for 09, 10, 12, uh, 11, like I was, you know, incredibly, incredibly strong player. And so I'm always going to win the internal games. Like, I'm going to be the strongest player. That's just like going to be true. Like, I was very, very good at the game. There's only so many players as good as me. And they hadn't yet worked the company. So, of course, I'm winning. Like, what else would I be doing? And, and like, <laughs> Obviously, like that sounds ego, but like it's also objectively I true, right? If, if if LeBron James plays some college basketball, are you betting on LeBron? Mm-hmm. Of course you are. Now I'm not LeBron, but that's still like the fact of the matter is, look, he's really good, and I was really good. So it was hard to say. That said, though, because I was very good at the game, I, I did have quite a lot of balance input, and so you know, yeah, if I thought something was too strong, I could talk about it. If I thought it was too weak, I could, I could talk about it. Like I would be in the play test for initially, you know, the char- the characters and whatnot, and so I would give feedback, and we would change things around, and then you know, we'd record. Oftentimes about four or five days before the video would go live um, at the kind of the tail end, all the graphics are in, you know, all the all the tooltips are updated. We have you know, the most up to date balance. OK, I'll record. I'll write. I'll send for localization and we'll post the video after editing. So, yes, there's been feedback for things being too strong and too weak. Like, <laughs> you know, not, not usually got, hey, it's too late. I've been playing the chant beforehand. You know, up to this yeah, point. I get there's two things I'm taking from that. The first is like statistically, I would imagine that there are, there's a far higher ratio of um, characters that launch that are more powerful than they really should be but the other thing i would take from that is you being a baller in the office with being ranked number one obviously by far the best league player because this actually brings me on to a question (laughs) because you've been in two tv shows right and one of them is the simpsons and the other was Mm -hmm. ballers with um dwayne johnson where you actually played your you basically played yourself right was right was it weird way what was this like i mean when you get that call up to the simpsons especially i almost feel like this is this you know, Golden Gate moment. Yeah, man. What was it like? Both of them. I, it's, it's really cool. So I'm a SAG accredited actor. I've only played as myself. I, I <laughs> don't think I can actually right. act, by the way, at all. I know I'm not very good at that, uh, but I can play myself because how hard is that? Yeah, it's really cool. Like, it, it's really cool to be in stuff, like to get to do cool things. Like, I've, I've had mm. a whole wealth of unique experiences in life, which is like very fortunate. Like, I, you know, it feels great. Yeah. In case of The Simpsons, it's like I drove down to the, you know, VO recording studio and met with the writers on the show or like for that episode. And they were great. And I filled out some paperwork and, you know, I recorded some lines and we figured out how they do the thing. It's this whole process for how they sync everything. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to say my lines through the lip movements of this character. And all right, 
uh, you know, whatever the lines were, you know, I don't even remember. And then also, okay, we'll do some pickups where we're just going to like do, you know, generic shout casting. It's going to be, you know, audio over the top of looking at Bart Simpson at his computer. Okay. Well, let's you just start yelling about how stuff's going on. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> very similar for ballers where, you know, they recorded the esports stuff separately. Right. So there were some scenes of, you know, some of the actors, you know, having dialogue in the stands and whatnot, but otherwise it's, you know, these players, you know, having their games and they have, you know, extras more or less playing as the other characters, as the other players in the game. And it's like, OK, yeah, here we are up in the casting booth and I'm just saying things like what normally. And yeah, OK, the backdrop, there's some Hollywood actors back there. But like, you know, I'm just doing the same stuff I'm normally doing. And also with Ballers, it was a VO, which is also at the same VO studio. And just, OK, well, yeah, we've got some gameplay. It's actually recorded. They're actually going to show League of Legends the show. Uh, so they've already done some gameplay capture. Okay, we're gonna cast over it. Okay, cool. You know, deliver some cool ending lines for you know who won. Okay, great. And so, uh, yeah, that was all. I mean, fairly straightforward. It was new experiences, but like you know, I'm not sitting there like hanging out with celebrities for a week or anything, right? Mm-hmm. It's like I'm at pretty normal places of work doing things I normally do. So you know, not that surreal ultimately. Do you know, it, it seems mad. I feel like it seems mad. Like I feel like it. I think it's brilliant. It, it just shows you the reach. Yeah. Of what you do of esports as well. Do you yeah. ever have you ever been stopped in the street? Like, has anyone ever seen you and be like, "Hey, David"? Or, um, do they call you David or do they call you Freak? Or, uh, yeah. it's whatever they feel like, um, honestly. So it's much more common at say like gaming conventions. You know, if I'm at mm. PAX or anything else, or I'm like at a League of Legends tournament, you know, like yeah, people there are gonna you know tend to recognize me and and stop and and say hi or maybe ask for an autograph or a picture or something. In real life, a little bit airports end up being fairly common. I wouldn't say every time by any means, but, you know, maybe, you know, there's 0.5 fans that talk to me per visit to an airport. It's like roughly long form bend the ratio. And it's like, yeah, I'm sitting there at my gate, whatever. And someone's like, hey, are you are you freaks? Like, hi, it's nice to meet you. Like, oh, I'm a fan. Like, oh, cool. Like, and they're like off to go somewhere else. Like, they're not going where I'm going, but like we're in adjacent gates and they recognize me because I'm just, you know, sitting there like on my phone for, you know, an hour or whatever. It's like, OK, that's, that's enough time for somebody to recognize. Like, OK, now I'm pretty sure that's him. OK, I'll walk up and say hi, whatever. Like I've had it happen in, in a restaurant as well, where someone's like, oh, hey, like, can I get a picture with you? It's like, yeah, sure. Or like, let me put my knife and fork down and, you know, we'll take a picture. Hey, thanks very much. Have a nice day. So so a very little bit. But like, again, I'm, I'm certainly nothing close to an A-list celebrity. Like, for the most part, nothing happens in my life. I mean, you're on this show, right? Like, look, That's true. You know I mean? I, in terms of like, you've also got me on the street. <laughs> you've also got 300,000 followers on Twitter, which is, sure. um, which is a lot. I was Because this, this kind of leads into my next question. It's... I'm not saying like you are solely, but like you are definitely are one of them. Do you, do you ever feel like, you, you know, there's a pressure because you are one of the faces of esports being like, so, you know, you are a recognized cast. The League of Legends is one of the largest, if not the you know largest competitive. Um, it's definitely the largest competitive MOBA. Like it's probably sure. at one point that definitely had the most players. I'm pretty sure it's going to be up there with Fortnite at the moment. Do you feel that pressure? Does that ever get to you? Not not really. So it's interesting because it's the whole adage around like boiling a frog in water where because I've been in League of Legends for so long, it's like, yeah, I was there when no one cared what the game was. And I was an intern. And then, you know, as the game grew and grew and grew. And then, you know, I was there with esports the whole time as well when it was just, you know, random stuff and, you know, taking time up, up at conventions to having its own avenues and in theaters and whatnot. So none of it's felt sudden. So none of it's been like, oh, suddenly I'm in the spotlight. Suddenly I'm like, part of this big thing. It's just like always been like, well, my job has just been League of Legends for my like entire adult life, basically, from my you know young 20s onwards, basically. So that said, you know, the other part of it as well is I've never like strived to be famous. I want to do a good job. Like I want to do good work. I want to be sort of helpful and, and useful. Like those are kind of driving factors for me. But like, I don't care if I'm suddenly not famous anymore. Like that's never been something that I like seek or or considered like a big perk of the job. Like it feels good to have people like come up to you and say hi and, and say they appreciate your work. And that's great. Like it, it does feel good. But again, like the fame is not something I really terribly care about. And so a lot of the pressure that does exist to you know some degree it's just like on me as me i don't care that i like supposedly represent league of legends and like in some people's minds and, and eyes i don't care about any of those sort of honorific titles or whatever it's just like okay well i'm me i don't want to let myself down like i want to do a good mm. job of what i'm doing and so it's just that my sort of generic drive to like do a good job that kind of says, okay, well, here's how we will or won't act because like I've got my own ethics and, and you know, morality and whatever. So I really don't feel external pressure, really. Do you, I suppose, linking onto that question, um, yourself and League, there's this almost intrinsic link with League, esports, yourself. It's almost synonymous, right? Like, and, um, well, that's from my perspective, but do, do, okay. do you ever have to filter 
how you feel about the game or social political topics as you have this responsibility to league and riot um and if you do like uh, how do you manage that because sure uh, must be yeah that's a good tough. question uh as far as the game i think it boils down to being constructive i have absolute access to the game designers on the game right like mm -hmm. if i think there's a problem in the game in about 12 seconds, I can write in the company Slack and be like, hey, I think this is a problem and have a discussion with people who are going to actively make those changes. And when we used to be in the office, I would eat lunch with those people a lot of the time. And like when they're talking about like, hey, we need to like make some updates to a collie. You know, she's a really big problem in pro play, but she's garbage for the average player. Like, how do you think we should fix that? I'm open to ideas, right? And I've had like direct input into the game. The most recent set of patch notes, not for the preseason update, but there was um, hot fixes to like champions that were buffed and nerfed and we changed one of the one of the sets of changes because I was like, hey, wait a second. I, I think this part right here is an issue. Could we change that? And they're like, yeah, good idea. Good catch. So like, you know, I have really, really good access into getting changes into the game if I think they're really important. So like, I don't need to like whine on Twitter if something's overpowered. Mm -hmm. I can talk to the game designers and have a discussion about that. So, you know, I want to give my coworkers and friends respect. So I don't need to whine about the job they're doing to the online masses. Like, how is that productive? That's so short-sighted and weird when I have access to them and I can be productive. So, you know, complaints about the game, I don't see a reason to air those. I can send them somewhere productive and useful, whatever. But hey, I do really love the game, right? The game's a lot of fun. Like, I do mm -hmm. want to be a force for positivity. You know, in general, I find it's kind of annoying to have a bunch of figureheads that are negative. You can admit when things are wrong, right? Or things are bad, right? If, if I'm casting League of Legends and, you know, they pick a champion, like, oh, I think that's the strongest champion in League of Legends. That's implicitly calling something overpowered. Right. Like mm -hmm. that's saying that there's imperfect balance here. This is, a, this is the strongest pick. This team is great. Every team should play this champion. They should play this champion. Like, yeah, like I can be honest when broadcasting as an honest broadcaster, but I'm not going to be like, oh, I can't believe right. Didn't nerf a poly already. It's like, that's not useful. Right. But I can say, oh, yeah, she's so good as, as a style. So right. Good. So, yeah. so, you know, th there's that as far as the like social political stuff. I mean, ultimately, I don't feel a lot of desire to post on social media about difficult topics. Some things are easy, right? And, and also actions speak louder than words. So it's like, hey, all my greetings are like, what's up fellow gamers or hello everyone. Like it's really easy to use gender neutral like greetings for people because why not, right? It's so easy to just like be more inclusive that way. That like, cool, I can, I can help be, you know, a very, very incredibly, incredibly small like bit of change to, to help people feel included. That's not hard to do. But, you know, so many topics are not only really spicy and really difficult and really just like difficult to get through, but also social media sucks for this anyway. Like, yeah, 100%. If, if, like if I wanted to actually really help and champion causes, OK, well, I can donate to charities. I can, you know, give a platform to charities and, and you know, announce them and you know try to help things happen and whatnot. But like Twitter wars are not going to actually help anyone. So why? Mm -hmm. Why bother um, is what that kind of comes down to. And, and then, you know, going an extra step farther in like actually campaigning for something or like if I was going to like run for some kind of office, it's like, well, I'd have to have a lot higher confidence in my beliefs to like do something like that. So it's like, well, mm -hmm. I spent some amount of time and what I believe to be more than the average person on various topics. And I have my opinions, but like they're not going on Twitter because there's no point. It's not productive yeah. in any way. So, you know, much like I don't complain about the game on Twitter. I talk to the game designers about it. It's like, well. I vote in local elections. I do some research. And if I believe really, really strongly, then maybe I'll build a platform or something. But like, you know, or I'm just I make the changes in my own life to, to be helpful. So, you know, I, I don't certainly ever feel like censored or pressured to mm -hmm. be silent. Um, there's plenty of politically active people at Riot and in esports as well. And it's not like they suddenly got fired because they have political opinions. But, you know, I just sort of spend my time in places where I think they're most productive or I'm already the expert. So yeah. I have plenty of opinions on League of Legends that I post on Twitter because I know enough that like, even if someone misquotes me, it's like, I have this body of evidence that can let you be like, well, you're misquoting me, right? Like, um, <laughs> so it, it's also that, right? Where obviously there can be bad actors, right? Where they're gonna, they're gonna mm -hmm. quote a sentence or a paragraph out of context or a tweet out of context because Twitter is not good for nuanced discussions. And, you know, so that, that's kind of the long answer is, is yeah, there's better place to spend the time. Talking to social media, obviously there's a lot of content about you out there. Right. I've seen some incredible stuff. I've seen like, that video. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Like, like, well, this it's is great. it. So, <laughs> it is so good. I've seen a video that slowly pans in on your face and you're looking at the camera and it's like got this like sex, like fuck me now song coming in. Like, I'll send it to you. Okay, um, great. But it's so, it's <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> but it's crazy. And like, um, obviously when I said I had you coming on the show, 
a couple of people were like, have you, have you, have you seen, like, have you seen this? I was like, oh my God. But this is what I was going to ask you. What's the, what's the weird, have you ever seen anything about yourself out there? You're like, God, that is a bit too weird. Is there anything that's been like, that's freaked you out? No, I've never felt freaked out. I've never had an in-person reaction where I felt like unsafe or, mm. you know, creepy or anything. So, you know, shout out to everyone being <laughs> above board human beings in person. That's good. I, I've had like toxic interactions. So fans of influencers can be very rabid, at least on Twitter. Mm. So I've had all kinds of people like say abhorrent things to me on the internet, but like, eh, I'm just used to it. Like I, it's, it's so brushed off. Like when you started asking this question, I was like, oh, absolutely nothing. And I was like, oh yeah, people have been toxic online before, but like, to me, at least specifically, it's so minor that I, I I forget it pretty much instantly. So yeah, thankfully, you know, nothing nothing horrible. What's the best thing you've seen? Have you seen anything? And you're like, oh, that's great. I'm gonna um, frame that. Yeah, it's actually my Twitter profile. Someone made a ceramic plate of my face. Um, <laughs> so they put, and this this is like got to be like six years old or something at this point. Uh, but they had like a ceramics class or something. So they they made a plate and they like shaped it or you know used color or whatever and like. You can tell what it is, right? Mm. Um, it's not, you know, a, a beautiful watercolor. You know, I, I don't know how hard it is to like make a face on a plate. <laughs> Absolutely fell in love with it. It's my Twitter profile for the last six years or however long. It is, it is a 10 it. out of 10. I, I love it. <laughs> so, oh gosh, you know, where do you, where do you see esports and mobiles going? Like you've been a part of this scene for such a long time now. Mm-hmm. And so you, you're going to have a better idea than most about where it's going to be in like five, 10 years. I'm going to say 10 years is too far. Too much can change. But say in the next five years, like where do you think it's going to be in five years time? Esports and MOBAs. I don't really know. Honestly, I'm, <laughs> I feel like I'm really bad at telling the future. But I mean, to me, it feels like the trajectory is still generally going to go roughly in the way of traditional sports, right? It gets, it gets bigger. It gets larger. There gets to be more fans. You know, there can be all kinds of structural changes with, you know, how players function and teams function and, and leagues function, how they work internationally. You know, you know, does this change around? It's to some degree. You know, who knows? Yeah, it's like if we're going to follow traditional sports exactly, it's like, OK, well, all the teams get, you know, their regional identities and they get stadiums and and we fill those out for the regular season games. You know, if the fandom grows by that much, that all happens. But like, I, I really don't know. It's, mm. you know, up to the right in general. I don't know if there's going to be some some huge silver bullet of MOBA design where like the game suddenly becomes a lot different. I mean, over the last 10 years, League has been, you know, certainly gotten better. Right. And things have changed around and, and people are learning, you know, more and more about how to you know design those games appropriately and whatnot. But I assume it's going to look fairly similar. I mean, League now to five years ago is honestly pretty similar. Right. Like the game and mm-hmm. the esport both. So, you know, I don't know what the next big jump is. You know, I think 2012, 2013 was you know one of the big breakpoints, at least for. North America and Europe, where there's an LCS and an LEC now, and that's going to be, that's a really big difference in what the scene looks like. But, you know, since then, it's kind of just been that, but improving. I don't know if we're going to have another leap like that. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but I don't really know. Yeah, I, I think personally, I'd probably like to see more unpredictability. I like and this is, I had this in all games. I've been playing Darkest Dungeon a lot recently, mm. and it's the unpredictability of situations and you trying to react to them. Now, you get that in League because obviously you're against people. Yeah. But if you're then say the map is unpredictable and watching people like these top tier players and even doing it yourself react to that whilst you're also reacting to the people you're against. Like, I know it's been implemented a little bit with the dragons, right? With right. The, how the dragons spawn. And, but um, I think if you building on that unpredictability and RNG to an extent creates um, situations where you don't know what's going to happen. When you always know what's going to happen, things get really boring really quickly. But sure. the more unpredictable things are, but they're manageable so you can control and create a solution within that time frame of a game which is say half an hour i think that's quite exciting that actually got pushed further so in the preseason update they added two more dragons so there's two more like map effects that exist they're, they're actually much more impactful than previous ones like they're intentionally a much bigger deal uh so do you remember rexai tunnels you know how those work you jump in the tunnel you go yeah the other side. yeah yeah i remember rexai yeah. yeah you could do so, yeah exactly so so one of the map effects is there's a bunch of rexai tunnels that spawn that everyone can use and so you can go from like the back of your red buff to over the baron pit to like the opposing yeah. blue buff and so <laughs> everyone has a Rek'Sai tunnel now. And it's like, well, that's going to be that's different. Good. And the other one, I think it burns away all the brush on the map or something like that. Mm. But it creates these zones of fog that uh, everyone's camouflaged inside. So it's a control ward or nothing. 
or or like your champion can reveal them, but like regular wars don't do anything. Um, so there's a bunch of areas you can sneak through and cover That's a lot okay. of distance on the ground that way. So and, and so I think you know things like that are interesting, right? Because the shape of the map will change game to game much more. And to your point about being against players, this is one thing that you get when you reduce the vision of the game when there's more fog of war, because then it's unpredictable. Okay, where is the enemy champion going? There's three places they could go. We don't know where they're going mm-hmm. to be. Okay, and those surprises kind of matter. And as long as you've tuned the game to a point where aggression is rewarded. If you can't react to all situations and aggression is rewarded, you just always go for it because the odds are you're right. The odds are they're not there and that creates action. So that is kind of the way, like very recently that the game's been progressing, which I think is actually quite positive. I don't know if there's more they could do. There probably is. There's always more, but like it is pushing towards unpredictability to a certain degree. It's interesting. You can definitely say, I remember when I was last playing, I remember it wasn't long before that, that like um, turret plates got added to encourage people to be more aggressive because you got rewarded for taking turret plates, right? Like gold. Yeah. Obviously you could snowball. And I know from what I understand, like the games are shorter now generally, which is fantastic. I think that's like a really important thing for people to be able to play more. And the last question I was going to ask you was, I ask everyone this, it's basically like, can you summarize your career in one sentence? And just to give you, you know, I always give the same example, but it's probably because, to be honest, it's the best one I've heard. And I'm sorry to everyone else who's actually said something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, compare, I understand. Uh, Lorne, Lorne Lanning, he, uh, he's the creator of uh, the Oddworld Games and Oddworld Inhabitants. And um, he said, brutally enlightening was his, uh, was his summary of his career. <laughs> but do you, do you have a summary of how, you know, your career so far? Um, falling into the next sort of fortunate circumstance. I guess <laughs> if, if, if just, in, in the in the line of of brutally enlightening, right? It's like, well, that's what I've been doing is <laughs> is I've been following my dreams and chasing them wherever they go, and understanding when some of them aren't working out, but being lucky enough that another door opens. And what it comes down to is like, I'll try to put another one sentence version. So we get we get two options, right? We get two trials here. <laughs> um, it's always being ready for the next door that opens. Because I think essentially to me, from what I've experienced with life and like, hey, I'm one of several billion people who have ever lived. So in my, you know, 0.0000001% of, of situations, you know, life is a bunch of RNG. It's like randomly some doors will open to you. Randomly some things will be available to you. And that's, you know, where you're born, who you're born, who you're born to, what kind of things are happening, you know, what's going on around you. You know, everyone's going to be born in, in, in their own unique circumstances. And like, that's fully random. You didn't get a choice there. But when circumstances do arise, it's like, are you ready? Have you in your past built up the skill set to be ready for whatever the opportunity is? And then also, are you in the presence of mind to then take that opportunity or take that risk or take that chance or whatever? And so for me, it's like, hey, like I've taken risks that haven't done anything. I mean, even in you know mundane things like I've been in relationships that were deeply flawed and we moved on and became better people. I've tried at things that didn't work out. Like I tried to compete in Warcraft 3 and that didn't work out. I made precisely zero dollars competing in Warcraft 3 and spent a lot of time doing that. But, you know, that taught me other skills in that world. You know, I took up audio commentary. I took up audio commentary and shoutcasting while competing in Warcraft 3. So I built a different skill set that I got to use going forward. And then another door opened where a friend of mine was like, hey, go apply to Riot. I'm like, oh, well, the good thing is I built all the other skills with all this time I spent in my, in, you know, the last few years of my life. And, you know, I'm fortunate that I have the support of my parents that I can, you know, quit college. This like, this is, this is lucky, right? Like not everyone has that situation. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, but then, you know, took the step and it worked out. And so that's been what's gotten me to where I am now. That was a good summary. Thanks. <laughs> that was good. That was good. I, nice. like, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Um, I hope you've had fun. Like it's, it's great. It's been a pleasure having you. I've just got to say, obviously a little disclaimer, like the opinions fair today are those of David and my own and do not represent our employers. If you want to reach out to us, you can at game dev show at ptw.com. But yeah, David, it's, um, yeah, it's been the greatest pleasure. Like it's been, Thanks. it's been so funny and so intense, and uh, I, just, I can't wait to see uh, what I'm going to listen to you guys for. Uh, but yeah, thank you for coming on the show. And yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a blast. Game over.